Good morning. It's good to be with you again. This will be the service for uh, Pentecost, this last Sunday of May, May 31st. Uh, and uh, we just pray that this service will truly be a blessing to you and to your family as well. Uh, today we'll be using Divine Service Setting 2 from Lutheran Service Book. Uh, of course, somewhat modified to fit the situation that we're recording here. Uh, the opening hymn for today is Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord, number 497 from Lutheran Service Book. Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord, with all your graces now outpour on each believer's mind and heart. Fervent love to them impart, Lord, by the brightness of your light, in holy faith your church unite, from every land and every tongue, this to your praise, O Lord, our God, be sung, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come, holy light, guide divine, now cause the word of life to shine. Teach us to know our God aright, and call him Father with delight. From every error keep us free, let none but Christ our Master be, that we in living faith abide. In Him our Lord with all our might confide. Alleluia, Alleluia. Come, Holy Fire, comfort true. Grant us the will your work to do, and in your service to abide. Let trials turn us not aside. Lord, by your power bear each heart, and to our weakness strength impart, that bravely here we and death to you, our Lord, ascend. Alleluia, Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority I therefore forgive you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God. 
whose majesty is over Israel, and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You Babel, 
because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thank to you. God. The epistle lesson for today is taken from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking, said, and they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lift up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, and the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 7th and the 14th chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And our second gospel for today is taken from St. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 23. And Jesus answered them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make a home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's, who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. 
And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The hymn of the day is taken from Luther's service book number 915. Today your mercy calls us. Please join in singing with me if you so desire. Today your mercy calls us to wash away our sin. However great our trespass, whatever we have been, however long from mercy our hearts have turned away, your precious blood can wash us and make us clean today. Today your gate is open, and all who enter in shall find a Father's welcome and pardon for their sin. The past shall be forgotten, a present joy be given, a future grace be promised, a glorious crown in heaven. Today our Father calls us, His Holy Spirit waits. His blessed angels gather around the heavenly gates. No question will be asked us how often we have come. Although we oft have wandered, it is our Father's home. All, all embracing mercy, O oh, ever open door, what should we do without you when heart and I run o'er? When all things seem against us, to drive us to despair. We know what gain is open, one ear will hear our prayer. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we consider our Old Testament lesson for today, we see the survivors of the flood and their descendants building a city and a tower to make a name for themselves. They were of one language and had gained just enough knowledge to be dangerous to themselves. God knew that if the whole human race remained united in its proud attempt to take its destiny into its own hands, there would no, be no limit to its unrestrained rebellion against God. So God confused their language and scatters them over all the earth, our text tells us. Unfortunately, things haven't changed much today, people. Our friends and neighbors may say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Not knowing how misled they are, just that they want to experience God personally, but spend no time getting to know him. Americans want to be known as spiritual, with no commitment to the one true God. As we live in such a religious culture, quite often we are confused as to what the Holy Spirit does and gives. We should not be confused when the Holy Spirit is considered as a created motion in worldly things, an impersonal being or a mere power. In today's Gospel, Jesus clarifies for us the office and work of the Holy Spirit. Without his works, we have no consolation and peace. John 14, 26 states, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
I'm certainly a firm believer in the Lutheran doctrine that the Holy Spirit doesn't work independent of God's word. In John 14, verse 29, Jesus says, I have told you now before it happens, so when it does happen, you will believe. Verses 23 and 24 of our John 14 text begins where Jesus answers the question by Judas, not Iscariot, by the way, why he reveals himself to the disciples, but not to the world. Jesus explains that he manifests himself to those who keep his words and love him. According to Jesus, to keep his words is to love him, and to love him is to keep his words. From John 14 and 15 and 8 and 17 and 1 John chapter 2 and from Revelation chapter 6 as well, this is listed. To keep his words also means that Jesus' words always come first. We don't change them. That would indicate that we don't love him. The language here reminds of Jesus' mandate in Matthew 28, 20. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you even to the very end of the age, part of the Great Commission. And when we refer, refer to verse 23, it not only takes us back to John 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, a reference, of course, to heaven. But it also evokes the rich Old Testament procedure of the tabernacle and the temple as Yahweh's dwelling place, mentioned in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and of course Kings as well. The fact that Yahweh dwelt among his people through the divine service of the tabernacle and temple, according to his mandate, brings to mind Jesus now dwelling among us in this day and age through the divine service of the New Testament church. Again, according to his mandate, an institution of the means of grace. In the church, the Father and the Son dwell among the people, walk among them, and serve them as their living God through the Holy Spirit. Those who keep Jesus' words and love him are not only safeguarded from future wrath, the devil, and all adversity, but also they daily receive his care for them here on this earth in both body and soul. Jesus reminds the disciples, the word you hear is not my own, but comes from the Father who sent me. A very good question to ask here is, does the Holy Spirit only work through the divine service? And of course not. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Saul in Acts chapter 9 certainly had heard the truth of the gospel, even though he spurned it and persecuted Christians. And then God strikes Saul with a light from heaven on the road to Damascus, and when he got up, he was blind until God restored his sight and brought him to faith through the prophet Ananias. The thief on the cross was certainly convicted by the Holy Spirit, having heard the truth at some time because he knows he is in the presence of the very Savior hanging on the cross next to him. In Genesis 41, 38, Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Of course, Pharaoh is a pagan ruler, but he does recognize there is something different about Joseph. In verse 39, Pharaoh continues, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. This brings to mind something else we must clarify. Knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. Satan knows there is a God, but he is not wise unto salvation. Pantheists believe that there is a God, but it won't save them because they don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, his death and his resurrection. In 1 Kings chapter 3, of all the things that Solomon could have prayed for, he prays for wisdom, so God grants his wish. A wisdom scripture has the following to say in Proverbs chapter 8, I wisdom dwell together with prudence, I possess knowledge and discretion, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and, and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 has this to say. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this that wisdom
preserves the life of its possessor. From Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1, Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of all things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes its hard appearance. It tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul prays for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. According to Luke chapter 6, the wise man builds his house on the rock, Christ, by obeying his commands. So when the flood comes, it can't shake the house because it is well built. So let's defer to Jesus' answer. As we answer this question we asked earlier, does the Holy Spirit work only through the divine service? First, Jesus chooses 12 common men to be his disciples, not men of high stature or high place, not kings or princes, just common men to be his disciples. And he instills wisdom in them by teaching them knowledge and by hands-on experience, by setting an example for them. Second, if the divine service were the only for the Holy Spirit to work, why wasn't Jesus' ministry then centered in Jerusalem at the temple? And third, to my knowledge, Jesus is only recorded at the te Jerusalem temple three times in Scripture. Luke chapter 2, when he is presented to be circumcised at eight days old, and then when he is 12 years old and stayed behind to talk with the teachers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus being at the temple during his passion for at least the clearing of the temple and the widow's might. Fourth, Jesus states himself in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Verse 20 of Matthew 5, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, as the once and for all sacrificial lamb, did away with the need for worshiping at the temple on Mount Zion, the city of David. Fifth, Jesus' ministry of teaching and healing, as recorded in the Gospels, takes place all over the countryside, on mountainsides, in villages, in homes, and once in a while, it's in a synagogue. Jesus wants his disciples to see God's Spirit at work and then promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples in our Gospel lesson from John 14, 26. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. God the Father sends the Holy Spirit just as Jesus promised on that first Pentecost. The disciples speak in tongues and all understand. The text fulfilled, it is of God, a response to the Tower of Babel that all might be saved. The disciples see firsthand the power of the Holy Spirit as he through them heals people and brings them to faith. We can't limit the power of the Holy Spirit. To do so is to go contrary to what God's word teaches us about his attributes and what we teach from the catechism to our children. God is eternal. As the psalmist said, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. God is unchangeable. He says, I, the Lord, I change not. From Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. God is omnipotent. God is almighty, all-powerful. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. 
You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Romans 11.33, of course, is one of the doxologies given in the Bible, but it has such depth, I want to mention a little from it here. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. God is omnipresent as well. God is everywhere and anywhere that he pleases at the same time. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord from Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. God is holy. God is sinless and he is pure and he says, I, the Lord your God, am holy from Leviticus chapter 19. God is righteous. He does what is right, for the ways of the Lord are right from Hosea chapter 14. We also know from Scripture that our God is gracious and loving from Ephesians chapter 2 and the book of Exodus and, of course, the New Testament and Christ's passion as well drive this home for us. I know that I received God's Holy Spirit in baptism as an infant when God worked faith in me just as he did for many of you. But I certainly don't want to discount those of you who repented of your sins and asked Christ into your heart as well. Certainly you received the Holy Spirit at that time also. I can tell you from experience that God can use his Holy Spirit to bless in any way that he desires. Another gospel lesson for Pentecost is taken from John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Jesus states, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Scripture confirms that on Pentecost, God delivered on his promise from Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And it states, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I can tell you God answers prayer through the Holy Spirit. I know that God still speaks to people through dreams, just as he did to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, because God spoke to me through the power of the Holy Spirit in a dream, and the end result was I went to seminary. As a pastor, I've seen God, through prayer, bring one Christian man who was clinically dead, blue in color, stiff to the touch, back to live for more than three years with his family before going to heaven. I've seen God bring a woman out of a coma when medical personnel were unsuccessful and live another six years in this world before going home to heaven. I've seen the Holy Spirit bring many people to faith, one after 20 years of prayer from his faithful wife. And I've seen God bring one of my college professors to faith over 20 years later after I had debated with him as a freshman about the existence of God in many of his classes and after class as well. And at the time, he was a confirmed atheist. I've seen the Holy Spirit work healing in my own family. And without the Holy Spirit, I can tell you that I could not stand before you and serve as a pastor. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives six woes to the Pharisees. We as pastors and Christians must be careful to not become modern day Pharisees in our attitudes towards worship, and the Holy Spirit, and violate the sixth woe, which states, Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered heaven, and you have hindered those who were entering. Unlike popular notions about the spirit and spirituality, the office and work of the Holy Spirit is for our comfort and for our joy. He is our helper, advocate, counselor, defender, and comforter. Constantly attacked by our sinful nature, the devil in the world, it may seem to us that we also have lost Christ. In our days of trial and temptation, the Holy Spirit directs us to the place where Jesus gives his peace and consolation in God's word through prayer and the sacraments. Luther once said this, if you want your sins to be forgiven, don't go to the cross, don't seek it in your heart, but he said, run to the Lord's Supper. 
There you will surely receive the forgiveness Jesus won on the cross for you as the body and blood of the Lord is put into your mouth to eat and drink. Where the Holy Spirit directs us, there Jesus dwells among us with the Father. He defends you from future wrath and the devil and cares for you daily, here and now, both in body and soul. The gift of the Holy Spirit people is beyond measure, beyond measure. It is overwhelmingly comforting. Blessed Pentecost for us today as well. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our good and gracious Lord, we come before you today, Lord, and we thank for all your bountiful blessings. We thank you for all that you provide for us, that you provided through your Son as well, Lord, his death on the cross and his resurrection, that we would have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the message you've delivered to us today, Lord, that you have sent the Holy Spirit to us. It dwells in us as Christians. We need only tap that Holy Spirit, Lord, the strength that it gives us, so that we can spread the gospel message to bring more people from darkness into your glorious light. Help us to realize, Lord, that we cannot limit the power of the Holy Spirit. It is so, so far beyond our imagination, Lord, but yet it does touch all of our lives personally. And for that, we are so thankful, Lord. We thank you for the comfort that it brings us, Lord, and the fact that it keeps us steadfast in the faith. We thank you, Lord, that you are our God and you have chosen us to be your children. We thank you that you all for all that you provide for us, Lord, Lord Food, clothing, shelter, family, and friends, all gifts from you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, gracious unto you. The Lord to lift his countenance unto you and give you his everlasting peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is 921 from Lutheran Service Book on what has now been sown. On what has now been sown, thy blessing, Lord, bestow. The power is thine alone to make it sprout and grow. Do thou in grace the harvest raise, and thou alone shalt have the praise. To thee our wants are known, from thee are all our powers, except what is thine own, and pardon what is ours. Our praise is Lord, and prayers receive, and to thy word a blessing give. O grant that each of us now met before thee here, may meet together